What is the future of AI? I think there's two things that are going to happen. One is changing our behaviors. The second thing is what I was talking to you about agents. The one thing that I'm most worried about with AI is exactly that. Marco Andre is the global head of generative AI and marketing at Novartis. He had a great career spanning over 20 years with giants such as Google, Procter and Gamble and YouTube. He has mastered this transition among industries starting with tech, then consumer goods, now health, but also he has developed a great insight into AI. How does AI work? AI is able to do something without being explicitly programmed to do a certain task. It's effectively the large language model. These are things that I think allow us to get 50% more output in 50% less time. We're talking about AI being trained with data. What is this data? This data is being taken from the internet in a very simplistic way. There's a, a big issue right now. A lot of the video models that are coming up, they were actually trained on YouTube videos without any kind of permission. There are specific applications of AI in which they're being trained on specific data for a specific industry or a specific company. But what about the ethical concerns around AI? There's a lot of ethical considerations because this has been incredibly fast. What should people do to learn about AI? What I always advise companies is to do three things. The first one is you need to educate people. The second thing I tell them is figure out how to partner. And the third thing is... Please hit subscribe to the show and leave a review or comment about how you find this episode. Marco, I'm so happy to see you at my podcast. <laughs> Good to see you, and Thank you for having me. All right. So uh, let's start first with uh, you telling us who is Marco. Marco is a marketer. I have been, think I've, I've been working in marketing since I was uh, a young kid. And uh, over the last 10, 15 years, I went through different stages. I was the traditional marketing Marco. Then I was more of a digital marketing Marco. And now I'm an AI uh, Marco. I think right now, uh, our job, which is marketing, is going through the biggest change of the last 30 years. And I feel a bit like a kid in a candy store every, with everything that is happening with AI and marketing. I can imagine. <laughs> AI is happening everywhere, right? It's not only in marketing, but marketing is, I mean, it's the most change there, right? Thanks. Hmm. Okay, so uh, this podcast, we're going to talk about AI. Actually, you're going to talk about AI. I'm going to ask questions. And it has to be about, you know, the basics of AI. Let's demystify this for people who are still wondering, what is it, why, how, etc. So uh, what is AI? What is the simple um, explanation um, for people who start from the basics? I like to say that AI is, in a very simplistic way, is making machines act like humans. What we've seen, AI has been here for 60, 70 years. We just haven't been able to interface directly with it in a way that people like you and I can do for the last 18 months. Yep. And I like to think about the difference between on one hand, applied AI, and what you hear now, the whole buzzword of generative AI. Applied AI is your recommendation engine or Netflix. Is your Amazon, you bought book X, you're going to get another one. Now, Netflix is if you watched Love Actually, you need to watch Notting Hill. That's applied AI, yeah? <laughs> generative AI is, it started in... 2017 roughly and it's this idea that you can generate something out of something out of a piece of text you can uh, generate text or image or sound or video or music so it's a very simplistic way but i think we all benefit as leaders from understanding the difference and being able to explain it to other people wow this was really well explained thank you so much it's very easy very simple terms so how does AI work? Can you go into the, um, you know, the different mechanics of AI, including machine learning, deep learning, and all these terms that people probably hear and they don't know what they mean? Sure. So if AI is to get uh, machines to behave like humans, machine learning is giving machines the ability to learn like humans. Yeah? Yeah. 
Deep learning is a subset of that, in which AI is able to do something without being explicitly programmed to do a certain task. It just learns by repetition on how to do something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A subset of deep learning, again, is generative AI. So that's all there is to it. And then you go within generative AI, you have large language models. In large language models, you have ChatGPT, which is the most well-known. So in a way, what we're trying to do is a lot of us think that this new wave of AI is only new tech and new data. But the reality is, since generative AI is so um, developed, you actually have um, new tech applied to all data, which before you would need armies of people, armies of humans to go through that data. Now you can use machines. That's right. For instance, one of the most interesting aspects of what you're doing now is in medicine with generative AI, because you can start figuring out patterns of data that could lead to an early diagnosis or a pattern that you figure out. And that's one of the things that I think are more exciting about this technology. When you were talking about medicine, I read somewhere, I think it was it FT, uh, that there was the first um, in dental surgery, the first um, cap was done by AI. The whole 15 minutes procedure was done fully, fully by AI, which is, <laughs> can you imagine there is no person, but just a machine. Would you trust it? I think it absolutely can. I think they're saying all of our roles in a way will change in a way, because what's happening with AI is probably people like you and me, we were valued in the workforce because we had knowledge and we had the experience. Now, I mean, the cost of knowledge is going to zero. Because if you're doing yeah. a job, I can get one of these tools, I can go to Claude and see, figure out which type of job do you have and use it. So I think other things such as storytelling, communication, leadership are going to become way more important. And I think we all need to get ready for that because it's coming and it's coming fast. Yeah, absolutely. It's coming fast. That's for sure. Um, so what type of um, AI are there? Can we just uh, clarify like a um, weak AI, strong AI, LL, LLMs, and what else is there? I never heard about maybe lack of knowledge on my side about weak AI or strong AI. I think the most important thing that I think exists now in AI, it's effectively the large language models. Mm -hmm. Because they allow you that from information that already exists, create something new completely from scratch or create something out of something. And the power is these large language models. I always like to use very practical examples. I think that's what we're missing right now. And if I am a leader, I can use a large language model, whatever, Claude, ChatGPT, uh, uh, Perplexity, whatever, to if I'm doing an agenda for an offsite, I can use it to create an agenda. If I want to generate a job description, a regular one, a general one, I can use it to do that. If I want to get a, the last podcast of Annie, I can go to Gemini and I can say, can you summarize this for me with the main points? These are things that I think allow us to get 50% more output in 50% less time. And we need to talk about the examples. I think that's what we're missing and that what leaders across organizations need is first make it work for them even before we even think of making it work for our customers or our consumers. We first need to understand it. Great. And uh, talking about uh, practical examples, what other examples you can give of application of AI in different industries? A lot of what is happening is all the applied AI branch, you can find that in multiple industries. You can find it in healthcare, life sciences, uh, mining, CPG. There's this example I always show in my keynotes, in my workshops of a camera that is tracking someone in the supermarket and figuring out if that person is trying to steal from the supermarket or not. That's an example of applied AI. On generative AI, what we're seeing is different examples. For instance, in the legal profession, Moderna came up with a very interesting example, which they have um, called something called my legal companion, which is if you are 
they have a new contract to analyze, their team has fed all of their previous contracts and analysis into a model, and they can actually immediately flag what are the bigger discrepancies and have that being an A to their work. The result, they can do be pretty effective, being mm-hmm. incredibly more efficient. And I think you see examples of that in pretty much every industry. And I think you're going to start seeing more. What about health um, and uh, what about finance? Do you have any examples there to share? So finance, for instance, there was this example of the Bloomberg LLM two years ago uh, or 18 months ago. What they wanted was to protect the data of Bloomberg and have a way to consult with it. So that was a very well-known example in which they decided to build completely their um, uh, both the data and the technology. I also seen examples, which is what I call a borrow, which is you start seeing companies, example, some on the CRM space, which they're doing is they have their own CRM. They do an initial set of training in the data with specifically for healthcare, and they bring them together. It's like having a car that is already almost ready to be driven, but you need the fuel, and the fuel is the data of your company. Yeah, I'm seeing more and more of those examples, and I think we're going to start seeing more of those. Okay, and um, um, in ChatGPT, I know that people can make their own GPT and train it. Uh, so, for instance, I can train it on my voice and what I say, and then somebody can use it to write things as if I'm writing them. Is that how it works? Can you talk about this a bit more? So, what that's called, what is called costume GPTs, which is it's very easy to create. Someone like me can do it. Anyone can do it. And what you do is you tell it what you want it to be. So, I'll give you a. <laughs> example that has nothing to do. So I have one, which is my Ralph. Okay. So I have a story that I built. Then whenever I'm having imposter syndrome thoughts, my imposter syndrome has a name and it's called Ralph. And <laughs> since Ralph is annoying, I married him with Ruth. So I have two people living in my head. So I call it a my GPT, a custom GPT, which is Ralph and Ruth. So every time I start thinking, oh my God, this didn't go so well, or or I'm in a lower mood or something, I go there and I put my negative thought. And then I have Ralph saying, yeah, you're right. You're so bad, Marco. And then Ruth comes and saying, Marco, is it that bad? Let's look at what you've achieved, for instance, during this day. So that's a very silly example, but how I use it to make it work for me. It's really like a a thought partner, a, a sounding board. Interesting. I have to try this. So you say this is uh, easy to do. I've tried some of these um, custom GPT and they really work. I have one for uh, for podcast, for instance. And uh, if I want to, to write show notes or anything or, or short script or any other thing, it knows what to do. I just input information about my podcast and it just gives me a first option and then I adjust it. How is AI changing the workplace? Because, I mean, what we're talking about, you know, chat GPT is not a kind of a workplace, how to say it, app or, or something people use. But how does AI change the workplace? I think a lot of what, it, what is happening right now is we've only seeing now the impact of some of these things. I was talking with someone in consulting the other day we were having a very interesting discussion, which is the model of some consulting companies is they hire 300 people at the bottom, out of university, and a lot of what they do is data crunching. Of those people, a percentage goes on and so forth. What happens to their whole model of career progression if suddenly you don't need 300 people, you only need 20 because the AI is doing the rest? So I think we're only now realizing some of the changes that this is bringing to the workplace. I like to think that one of the things we need to do, I'm actually going to start a series of posts on that, is think about the future after the future, which is, okay, tomorrow we have saved 30% of time or we would increase our productivity. And increasing productivity can be not only saving time, but increasing creativity, driving customer experience. What do we do with that time? 
what do I do at that time? I'm not going to go golfing, but how that get that time to be put back and how are, what are the implications for my profession? And again, of my, of the teams that I manage, of the partners I interface with, I think those changes are becoming more and more evident and we all need to be thinking about it. Okay. So, um, we're talking about AI being trained with data. And what is this data? Where is this data taken from? Okay, let's start with this and then I'll develop it further. Sure. So this data is being taken from the internet in a very simplistic way. So at the beginning, there was this idea that was taken from Reddit threads, from Google. There's a, a big issue right now, which a lot of the video models that are coming up, like Sora, like Flux, they were actually trained on YouTube videos without any kind of permission from the creators of those videos. But let's think that this data is being trained on all the data that is publicly available. available. Mm -hmm. Then there are specific um, applications of AI in which they're being trained on specific data for a specific industry or a specific company. That is an example that I gave you of my legal companion at Moderna. They mm -hmm. took their own data, their own legal documents, they applied it in a GPT and got trained on that data. There's talks without getting to an issue that is now happening is the moment we run out of data, how can these models be trained? So there's a certain conversation around the ability that the AI will generate synthetic data to allow for the models to be trained. But I think that's way out of my league, but it's something that is out there because it's a limitation how you train these models. Yeah, well, I heard about uh, this tool. My first impression, a feeling about this is it's not right because what does it mean, sy synthetic data, right? means that it's not real. So uh, how can we create something that's not real? But anyway, I've changed my mind so many times about AI because I you actually see it from a completely different angle and you think that you never thought a possible before suddenly, suddenly become possible. Yeah. And you feel how your mindset changes. And that's exactly how we have to progress. But... Um, but what about the ethical concerns around AI? And, uh, you know, there are lots of people voicing concern about, first of all, the speed of how this is coming in and the fact that um, the tech companies have the expertise and knowledge and that's it. I mean, the regulators, government have no knowledge, but they have to catch up. So how do they regulate? How do they make sure AI doesn't fall in the become a threat rather than help? There's a lot of ethical considerations because this has been incredibly fast. This has been like unlike any technological advancement we've ever experienced, certainly in our lifetime, I think way more than our lifetime. So the technical considerations are many and there's a lot of bad things happening. An example is deep fakes. We're soon at the verge of not knowing what's going to be true or not anymore. But my point is, what I see happening sometimes, Annie, is we resort to not talking about it, saying A is bad, so we decide not to talk about it. And I think that's wrong, because if we decide not to make it work, not to put guardrails in place, not to put policies in place, we're also missing out on the potential upside we have for some of these things. So are there several ethical considerations? Yes, every day. But I don't think that is a reason not to have discussions to make it work. And to your earlier point, I like to think that I am the same. I feel I'm in the five stages of anger every day. <laughs> I'm in denial. This is not going to actually impact me. Anger is not very important. Bargaining it doesn't affect me, will never affect me. Depression, I'm going to lose my job. And sometimes acceptance, this is incredible and has incredible potential. And I think being kind with ourselves and people that work with us, realizing it's a big technological change. It's quite important in realizing that at any given day, we might be in each one of these five stages. Talking about people and um, sometimes people feeling completely overwhelmed by the speed of how everything is moving. What should people do to learn about AI and to start changing their mindset so they are ready for how this is going to develop? What I always advise people is to choose one tool 
and max it out. Use it. Don't worry about all the things you read. Don't worry about the latest. Choose one tool and use it. If you're a designer, if you're a marketer, go on Canva and see the incredible amount of things that you can do that you were never been able to do. I was never been able to design an interesting PowerPoint. Now I can do it with a prompt. I've never been able to edit a video properly. Now I can do it with CapCut or Opus Clip. I've never been able to generate pretty interesting images with Photoshop. Now I can go into iDigram or MidJourney and do it. And I think when people start seeing some of these things, and these are more, let's say, flashy things, but I also like to think about the boring ones. You need to get a gift for your partner? Go there and have ChatGPT give you seven different options. You're going to travel to a certain country? You know, talk to Claude and say, give me a few options here. Here are my, act as my travel advisor. When people start realizing that's actually something that helps them, I think it's the best way not to get overwhelmed and understand what they can do with the technology. And in the workplace, what would you uh, suggest for people in the workplace? What I always advise companies is to do three things. The first one is you need to educate people. We are doing a very poor job, all of us, on educating people. Mm. We are not... uh, spending the time we need on exactly showing people examples, showing what they could do with tools. And that is a problem because by definition as humans, what we don't know, we fear, and what we fear, we don't invest in. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing I tell them is figure out how to partner. So you've heard me talking about build, buy, and borrow. The reality is this is going so fast that you can't do this on your own. So having a clear strategy what do you buy? Okay, co-pilot for your whole organization or for a subset of people, even better, that then become your champions. Building, the example of Bloomberg LLM. A borrow, this idea of the CRM that I was talking to you about. So figuring out what is your partnership strategy, how to do that. And the third thing is what I was telling you. Think about the future after the future for every role, every function within your industry and sometimes even in your costume. What does that mean? Where is the world going? We talk about go-to-market. The best way to figure out your go-to-market is literally to figure out where the market is going. And how do you see where the market is going? We see already, I don't know about you, Annie, but I barely use Google search now. So what do we need to change as a marketer, for instance, to understand that there's going to be a communication that I would be able to get into, which is SEO, So I would be able to be between you and what you would search in Google, how I'm going to get into that relationship also in an LLM. Those are the things that I think we need to all be thinking about. Yeah, when we mentioned Google, I only use Google when uh, ChatGPT gives me some examples, you know, scientific paper or this magazine, that quote. And I go and check just to make sure that this exists. And, you know, uh, the progress is immense because when it started in November 2022, I think, um, in the first six months, there were a lot of errors. There were a lot. I mean, I would check everything and it, most of it would come out as not existing or, you know, now it's like I can't remember the last time I checked something and it was not true. So it just also going very, very, very fast. Okay, so um, what is the future of AI? You said that um, we are just in the absolute beginning of things. How is it going to go? Not that you have a, a crystal ball, but <laughs> what do you see at the moment, the potential future? I think there's two things that are going to happen. Uh, one is changing our behaviors. So we will be, I think, my hope, is that we're going to be interfacing way more with technology through voice and we're going to be interfacing way less with screens. That's a hope that I have that AI is going to bring us. Just remember this second thing. So can you go a little bit more in that interfacing with uh, voice? So I will give you an example. And no I- screens. That's that's the, the, the part that I'm very interested in, no screens. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Now we're having a podcast. What we can do with, I don't know, Otter AI as an example. At the end of this, you would have 
be taking notes for your podcast. We would get those notes automatically at the end. Any action items, if this was a meeting, any key points that stood out, and you could say, okay, can you give me a description for the podcast that I'm going to publish? And imagine that during the course of this meeting, I would say, hey, Annie, you should get in touch with person X. Yeah, I will make an intro. At the end, instead of me going into my laptop or my phone, I would just say, hey, LLMX, please send an intro. Here's, I'm, I will detect to you the, what it should say. Send an email connecting Annie and person X. This is what I mean. I think we have a possibility to do that. If we will take advantage of it, I don't know. But I yeah. think a lot of what forces to our screens nowadays, aside from social media, obviously, is the fact that if I'm doing something with you, I need to go on a screen to do an action. I think with the progress that we're going to have, which is the second thing, which is agents. So you will, be, you heard, you will hear about, about this agent. Agency is basically, if you think about this, the next level of LLMs, which is large action models, in which you go not only from generating something to generating an action. Now, this is still far because while in an LLM you can bear with hallucination, okay, imagine, doesn't give you an exact word. If suddenly I would say to an agent, hey, can you get in touch Annie with person X if you send me to person Y? And if the person Y is someone you don't know, that's a bit of a screw up. But I think that's the second thing that AI is going to bring us. I do believe there's a future in which we will have for what we currently use brute force, what I call brute force, which is a very repetitive task. We'll have agents doing it for us. We, we will have mini Marco or mini Annie doing it. And that will liberate time for us to do other things. I believe that's coming and it's coming quite fast. You know what uh, that reminds me of? Um, I'm a big fan of Marvel movies. And uh, uh, Iron Man has this... Um, Jarvis. Jarvis. And then some Monday, was it Monday or Sunday? One of the... Monday. Monday was his last um, assistant. So that's what I imagine. You just say, so that's it. And how oh, it would be great. <laughs> so... I use that example all the time. I didn't know you were such a Marvel fan. I'm absolutely Marvel fan. And then also it shows us the future of AI because Jarvis became a person. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> all right. So back to planet Earth and um, reality. So I interrupted you. What was the second thing for the future of AI you wanted to say? The second thing is what I was talking to you about agents. I think first ah, you okay. have to interact with voice in way less reliance on screens and way more on human connection. And the second one is agents. Paradoxically, you can call me romantic, but I do think AI gives us the opportunity to be way more human. Because if you think I about agree. we're dedicating so much time to things that honestly, they don't matter so much. Absolutely. And I think we have the opportunity to free up time to have way more human connection in relationships. I don't know if we're going to take advantage of that or not, but that's what my hope is. I hope because when you were talking about the future and I was thinking if really this now takes all the points and makes everything, edits the video, does this and that, I mean, prepares the whole podcast, right? I don't need to go to the company I'm working with, right? Or whatever. Imagine, huh? oh my goodness, that would be so good. It will save so much time. What about the society? Is the society ready for AI? And here I'm talking more about the negative sides of it, like fake news, fake videos, because we are in a moment where truth is difficult to find without an AI. And uh, now with an AI, are we going to survive? The one thing that I'm most worried about with AI is exactly that we're not going to know what is true or not anymore. So are we prepared? No. Can we do something about it? A hundred percent. I think we have a role, all of us, on talking about it, on raising issues, on calling out the companies producing these things to come up with their own uh, rules and regulations, on catching up with our governments to make sure this is being regulated. And I think we have quite a few learnings of what happens when, for instance, with social media, which is not regulated at all for many years, and the impact that is having. So my hope is that we do that. 
The drawback of that is I see still, and I talk with a lot of people, I see still that a lot of people are in the denial phase. And the problem with the denial phase is that you don't think about things, you just dismiss them. So it's way easier to say, yeah, AI is bad. I don't want to use it. But there's still going to be people going to be doing deep fakes. It's way more important that we think, okay, the technology to do a perfect deep fake, I just need one picture of you, Annie. And I will put you speaking, I don't know, Romanian or uh, yeah. uh, Brazilian Portuguese. Or Greek, to that matter. Or, or Greek, to that matter. <laughs> So I'll be happy with that. The question is, if we don't have guardrails or yeah. accountability for the companies that make this technology available or the countries that uh, can regulate this technology, we will not be doing a, a good job. And I, that's why I insist so much on talking about it and educating people about it. No, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Okay, so we talked about AI all the time. Let's talk about you a little bit with some um, personal questions to finish off. Um, what was the best day of your life and what was the worst day of your life? The best day of my life, I always had a, a very big connection to the sea since I lived next to the sea. I remember vividly, I think it was roughly 14 years ago, I had joined my, my previous company. I joined Google, which is a big thing for me because I wanted to always work in a tech company. I always wanted to work in marketing. And suddenly I was there working in marketing. And I was on a work trip, turned personal trip with a few of my colleagues. Um, and I just remember this perfect end of day. We were in Hawaii. There was this perfect sunset. It's almost out of a movie. And I really thought to myself, wow, okay. I worked really hard, but I was put on this path to become a marketer, which is something I wanted for years. So I remember that day. I could describe perfectly that end of day. Um, I think of the worst day in, in my life, I think one thing that is pretty hard for people like me that spend, you know, more than half of our careers in a company is that I was for many years Marco from Google. And then there was one specific day, and I think that happens with a lot of us. Yeah. And that's why I ended up going into the personal branding space also. That it was an event or something in which someone said, oh, you don't work at Google anymore, so we don't want you or we don't need you. There was something like that. So I think career-wise, that was such a difficult, because I realized the thing I relied on wrongly for validation for so many years was that I was the Marco from Google. And that's what led me after a period of recovery to start writing on LinkedIn. Because as much as it's good, people think that having a, an identity outside of your company is bad. That means you're not committed. I've always been committed in every company that I work for. But I think there's value to the world and to the company that there's Marco Andre that happens to work at Novartis right now. It doesn't mean that he's not incredibly focused and good at his job, but he also has his identity, his values, and those things can live together. But at the time, it was quite hard. And when people ask me why I spend so much time and effort building my personal brand, is exactly because of this. I think we might be working in the best job in the world with the best company in the world, but it's in their interest, in our interest, that we're not relying on that for validation. Yeah. Exactly. No, very well said. Very well said. Uh, one of my other guests uh, described that very well because he said, uh, when we work in a company, they give us a crown. They give mm. us a crown and we put the crown on and we are the kings and the queens, right? But then when we stop working in this company, the crown, they take the crown away. So suddenly we are just nobody. It's so true. you better be somebody all the way. That's great. And um, what is one thing that we still don't know about you, Marco? Well, you can probably guess, but I'm a big Lego addict. <laughs> it's a nice story. I was very lucky. My parents gave me my first Lego when I was two or something. And then I spent my whole teenage uh, years building. And suddenly I became stupid and uninterested in Lego. And then I only picked it back in my adulthood five or six years ago. 
and then I never stop. It's the the thing that I it it grounds me and allows me to be creative. It allows me to feel that I'm building something, and really well helps me wind down and has been an incredible privilege to be able to get back to it and realizing. I do think a lot of us that work in corporate jobs or in business, we don't see a lot of the output of our actions. So going back to something, I think that's what happened with a lot of people during the pandemic. People went cooking or gardening or writing. I think Lego gives me that perspective and that calm place. So as you can see, the result is behind me. You're building complex ones. Yeah, I like the big ones, yes. But I all all instructions. I am not one of those incredible master builders that out of a bunch of bricks, they create something. I am not like that. But uh, I do like the big ones, yes. I like the complex ones. (laughs) Um, And just to go back to your career, so what were the different companies you worked in? So I worked in Procter & Gamble. Um, I worked in Google for 10 years. I did different roles, uh, local, regional, global. Did worked on YouTube for a couple of years. And for the last um, three and a half years, I've been working at Novartis in in Pharma. And how did you make these transitions? Because they're very different companies. There was no master plan. I always laugh (laughs) when people in interviews get, get asked, where do you see yourself five years from now? Good luck. (laughs) <laughs> There's no master plan. I think I was just, I always try to make choices that would get me closer to what the market needed, what I was good at, good at, and what I can bring about. I think that's always been like that. When I was in Procter & Gamble, I wanted to go to the best marketing school in the world. And then when I was there, the opportunity to work in marketing at Google, and I lo- always loved tech, it came up. And then Google, I had an incredible ride of 10 years doing pretty much everything. When I joined Google, they had 20,000 people. When I left, they had 300,000. Not because of me, obviously, yeah. but just <laughs> the company evolved. And uh, then what made me go into pharma and life sciences is I wanted to be in a place where I thought digital was needed and it could have an impact. And what I always say about now with this wave of AI and why I'm so focused on AI and life sciences is if you think some of these things that we discussed, they give you speed in time to market, okay? And speed in our industry means that you either extend someone's life, increase their quality of life, or save their life. Yeah. That's why I'm not, I'm not the only one saying this. There's an interesting article on Anderson Norwood saying exactly, that's exactly why AI is having so much impact in life sciences, because the impact can be actually incredible. And that's what led me to, to pharma. Yeah. How did you start learning about AI? It's interesting. I was, uh, it was December 2022. I started a new job doing all the marketing capability training for Novartis. And at the time, I went to my manager. And I said to her, hey, listen, I think there's this new thing, AI is coming. I'm reading about it on LinkedIn. And I think it's going to change everything in marketing. So can I train people on this instead of marketing? And she's an incredible leader. And she said, yeah, you can. I said, you're not going to ask me? You're not going to challenge me? (laughs) Just (laughs) something like, you know nothing about AI. (laughs) And I said, yeah, I don't, but no one does. So I started reading a lot about it. I started checking a lot of posts, a lot of books. And I just started, honestly, as I was saying earlier, using the tools. I always tell this story. The first time I used ChatGPT in a corporate environment was January last year because I wanted to bring my dog to the office. And they said, okay, come up with a proposal and a policy, do a benchmark, come back in a couple of months. I came back the morning after. (laughs) Because <laughs> I used to... so I, I work by by chance. I just develop a very big taste, and I think I'm now really focused on the purpose. And I think my purpose behind it is I do think AI is here to make a much better version of us because it allows us to save time that we waste on things that don't matter so much, and that's my purpose uh, behind what I'm doing right now. 
That's a great ending. I'm not going to ask any more questions because what you just said is, is absolutely great. For ending the podcast, thank you so much for your time and for um, really interesting examples and everything you shared today. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for having me.